All righty. Thank you, Sally, and, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Washington Space Business Roundtable Leadership Forum. Uh, I am Jack Fisher, Chief Technology Officer of the Space Business in Collins Aerospace, uh, and that is a key part of Raytheon Technologies. It is an incredible privilege for us to sponsor this event as we congratulate the United States Space Force on what has been a truly historic year of accomplishment. Space Force is on an exciting trajectory and at Collins Aerospace, we stand ready to help meet those challenges that lie ahead. We do know a little bit about challenges in space, having enabled human spaceflight since the Gemini and Apollo programs up through the planned Artemis missions. We've developed systems ranging from radios and controllers to life support and spacesuits, and are key players in the connected multi-domain battle space, which underpins our nation's strategic posture for future conflicts, particularly in space. Like us at Collins, I know everyone in this virtual room commends the Space Force for what has been achieved in one short year. As we say happy birthday, we eagerly set our gaze on the next steps in America's presence in space, a presence that will be fueled by the Space Force efforts to secure the domain. And as a special treat today, we have the U.S. Space Force Director of Staff, Lieutenant General Nina Armano as our keynote speaker. Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Armano's biography makes even the most accomplished feel ashamed, as she is a powerhouse in the space industry with an enviable record of accomplishment, operational leadership, and strategic vision. Among other things, she is the only person to command both of our space launch wings and was the first female general officer commissioned into the Space Force. In her current role, Lieutenant General Armagno is responsible for establishing and shaping a state Space Force service level staff and the interactions of this lean, agile group with the entirety of government and industry. That is no small task, but there is no one better suited to meet this challenge head on, leveraging innovation and synergies across industries to remain always above or simper supra. So without delay, it is my great honor to introduce one of the Space Force's premier leaders, Lieutenant General Nina Armagno. Ma'am. Thank you too, Fish. And thank you, Sally, Janice, and Tori uh, for setting all this up. Um, I really am honored to be part of your program today with the Washington Space Business Roundtable. Um, to be a guest speaker uh, in in uh, an event that you know I'm, I'm really proud you're continuing. You're continuing to carry on the conversation despite the pandemic, and I I think it's really important, especially for the nascent United States Space Force. Uh, thank you all for inviting me and thank you to Fish for that great intro. Uh, before I get into my remarks about how the Space Force is doing, uh, I think it's worth noting the importance of space to our nation. Um, you know, so if you'll just indulge me to kind of frame where we are today. Uh, space is part of the American way of life. It is also part of the American way of war. Uh, space is integral to our modern life, uh, our nation's security, our prosperity, and our scientific achievement. And it's critical to the joint fight. Uh, we provide exquisite data from amazing sensors uh, in all orbits to our joint force, uh, namely uh, systems you're familiar with, like GPS, other systems uh, like our strategic satellite communication systems, our missile warning systems. We even provide weather to the joint force. And this is the joint force now in all domains, air, land, sea, and even undersea. You can see that the Space Force is critical to the joint force, um, but there is a threat and that threat is real. That threat is looming and it's very specifically Russia and China being able to threaten United States satellites in every orbital regime. That's in the low Earth orbit, about a thousand kilometers above the Earth's surface, the home of our intelligence 
surveillance and reconnaissance satellites. That's the medium Earth orbit, about 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, home to GPS. And the geostationary Earth orbit, about 76,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, that is home to our most high valued assets, our strategic missile warning, our strategic military satellite communication satellites. And I know that you all know there's other orbits. Those two will be threatened by the year 2025. Um, I think you all saw the segment uh, released from US Space Command uh, very recently that uh, talks about Russia's activities uh, testing a, an ASAT missile uh, just, uh, just the other day. So space is important to us, critical to the joint fight, but there's a looming threat. Therefore, the nation must do something about this. The nation must act, and it did, by establishing the United States Space Force, and it is now our responsibility to develop it. The mission of the United States Space Force is threefold. To protect the interests of the United States in space. Number two, to deter aggression in, from, and to space. And number three, to conduct space operations in those vital areas I just mentioned. Space and the Space Force will continue to project space power through conflict. We will continue to provide those world-class capabilities from space. But we're going to have to figure out how to protect and defend those high value assets. We're going to have to build resilient constellations, resilient architectures, moving from the stove piped capabilities that exist today, where you have a satellite or satellite type of capability connected to a single type of ground station and then connected over to a single type of user equipment. That stove piping is uh, what we're changing. We are in, in the throes of uh, changing these architectures because you can imagine that if, if there's a single satellite, a single type of satellite that does a mission, for example, missile warning, there's a vulnerability now we know in space uh, on that satellite. There's a vulnerability there. There's a vulnerability between the satellite and, and, and the ground. So that link is vulnerable. The ground stations are vulnerable. The link to the user equipment is, is vulnerable and the user equipment is vulnerable too. And so our future uh, resilient architectures will be layered and hybrid so that several types of satellites, for example, missile warning, at several different uh, orbits will be contributing to the mission of missile warning for our nation. We have to as well figure out how to have an offensive punch. We're going to be able to, um, if we're gonna survive in a war fighting domain, we're going to have to have defenses and offenses. And that is, uh, those programs are things that we are thinking about today, working on today, and um, absolutely need for a future which may include war that extends into the space domain. Our first year has been amazing. Gosh, we've done a lot of things. I'm just gonna talk about a few, but there, there are so many things. Um, today is day 361. We have uh, four days until we are one year old. Just some examples surrounding the Space Force. Uh, back in the spring, we, we were hiring our first tranche of civilian positions. Uh, there were 41 positions that we were advertising and no less than 5,722 <laughs> applications came in uh, for, for us to review and select 41 uh, civilians. In the summer, we began uh, transfer boards where we evaluated uh, nominations from across the Air Force, people who volunteered to transfer into the Space Force, and we got 9,000 applications. Uh, and that uh, the response has just been fantastic. Today, the US Space Force military and strength is at 
2,232. This is on our way to a total of about 6,000 uh, military in a 16,000 strong force. That's the size of your space force. We will be no larger than 16,000 people. Um, so we'll be small, agile, lean, and lethal. We built our first palm this year. Um, about a year ago, the Secretary of the Air Force agreed that 10% of the Air Force budget would be carved out for the Space Force. Uh, most of that was Space Force uh, TOA anyway. I mean, it was, it was, it was dollars that we were already uh, planning for for space programs, and uh, it, it got carved out. It was uh, 15.4 billion, uh, and that's about 10% of the, the Air Force, Department of the Air Force budget. But it was the first time space owned its own budget. And uh, we took it through the whole process here in the, the Pentagon, uh, all through uh, the Palm budget into uh, presenting our budget estimate for the year. Uh, it's been quite a process. Uh, we can you know, get into that in Q&A if you'd like to, uh, because I was personally involved in that before I became the director of staff. We transferred uh, 23 organizations, 23 Air Force organizations transferred within uh, 180 days to the Space Force. The secretary challenged us to get it done in, in, in 180 days, and we did just that. The latest uh, uh, couple of, um, of, of units that we're working with now are in the intelligence, in the intelligence community. We are working on standing up a uh, national Space Intelligence Center, uh, and our our first step toward doing that is going to be a Space Force Intelligence Activity. The uh, IC just agreed with our way ahead on that. In fact, uh, not only did they agree with that activity, but they agreed to uh, have the United States Space Force become the 18th member of the intelligence community. I know you saw that recent announcement. We published our first doctrine this year, and I'm. I'm uh, going to do a little bit of show and tell. This is our uh, Space Force capstone document. It really was uh, written by the Space Force for the Space Force. What I'm most proud of is, is it was actually, uh, you know, initially written by 20 airmen, 20 uh, space-minded airmen uh, before the Space Force stood up because they knew we needed doctrine, if there's going to be uh, a conflict in the space domain, if, if the space domain is going to be uh, considered a new war fighting domain, which it is, my goodness, we're going to need doctrine. And so uh, I, I'm just so proud of the fact that this is a grassroots effort. Certainly Air Force uh, Doctrine Center helped us uh, finalize it and put it all together in the form that you see. But I just want to read a, a caption from this because I'm I'm really blown away at what came out of the minds of our lieutenant colonels. We're talking lieutenant colonels, some colonels, but lieutenant colonels and majors who wrote this. I'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll read a paragraph. Just like warfare in any other domain, space warfare is a violent clash of opposing wills. Notably, the adversary in space warfare is never a spacecraft or some other inanimate object. Space warfare targets the mind of an adversary and seeks to neutralize their capability and will to resist. Military space forces compete against thinking actors who threaten our nation's prosperity, security, or political aims. Thus, military space forces must prepare to outwit, outmaneuver, and dominate thinking competent and lethal aggressors who are attempting to thwart U.S. actions. Wow, looks like they nailed it from day one. We've also had some uh, other firsts in the Space Force. We graduated our first non-commissioned officer academy, NCO academy. We held our first uh, United States Space Force promotion board. That was for chief master sergeants and those results were announced last week. We graduated our first basic military training uh, set of, uh, of space professionals. There were seven who graduated 
on the 10th of December. And, uh, it, you know, the, basically the, the first just uh, keep stacking up. It's a really exciting time to be part of the space force. We also published something else I'm going to show you. I know this is a, as well as the doctrine, this is also available online and you might not be able to see it from the glare, but this is the uh, chief of space operations planning guidance. General Raymond issued this planning guidance to the United States Space Force in order to do what a service should be doing and a service should organize, train and equip. This guidance actually adds integrate and innovate. So the, the planning guidance becomes the CSO's top five priorities. Organize, he tells us to empower a lean and agile service. Train, he tells us to develop joint warfighters and world-class teams. Equip, he tells us to deliver new capabilities at operationally relevant speeds. Some of those capabilities I mentioned earlier. Integrate and innovate under integrate. He wants us to expand cooperation. That's among allies. That's among industry academia. And he wants us to innovate. This is where the space force mantra is born digital. Uh, and, uh, and he wants innovation to be just part of the, the core of our being uh, as space professionals in the space force. So, diving a little bit deeper into the uh, planning guidance. When we empower a lean and agile service, we're doing this because we know future wars that begin or extend into space will be fought at great distance and tremendous speed. Therefore, fast matters and agility is key. In order to do this, we are in the business of de-layering. At the service headquarters, which didn't exist before here in the Pentagon, we have capped ourselves to 600 people. Uh, we had uh, done some research last year and the number was uh, around, you know, a little bit over a thousand, a thousand thirty five is what the, those initial estimates were for the number of people required to run the headquarters, United States Space Force. We've capped ourselves at 600 to continue to make it work in the field. We've reduced two layers of command. We've reduced the numbered Air Force, so 14th Air Force no longer exists. And we've basically combined the group level and the wing level of command and called those deltas. So, um, the, you know, the, and the reason we did this is to shorten the distance between decision makers and tactical experts and, and the other way around. So speaking of, of experts, train to develop joint warfighters and world-class teams, we have the opportunity to build something new and different here, a new kind of joint warfighter, one who understands the character of war in space, one who is led by our core values as our Polaris, where diversity is key to the Space Force, where we recruit talent, yet retain families, where we we have realistic training where space professionals can fight in a real fight a realistic adversary in a realist realistic environment and you know develop warfighters who uh, have these key attributes of critical thinking and creativity because you know as we move in this new domain as we continue to grow and develop innovation is going to be totally key creativity we're going to be facing challenges we've and uh we're gonna we're gonna need innovators war fighters who can also think outside the box equip as the third priority uh we already talked about the threats from year uh, uh, that we see coming from the intelligence community telling us that year 2025 is uh potentially going to be a challenging year well, we continue to uh, project space power in conflict, our, our uh, planning guidance tells us to build, protect and defense capabilities for, their high, for our high value assets, build the resilient constellations I mentioned earlier, and 
an offense of capability that today doesn't exist. In fact, today we don't have defenses, we don't have offenses, but we need to build those uh, to have a credible fighting force in our new war fighting domain. For integrate, we want to expand cooperation. The US does not go it alone in space. I know you've heard General Raymond, our CSO, say that, um, but it's true. We have, uh, we have to have partners. And in fact, our closest partner will be the Air Force because the Space Force is a subordinate of the Department of the Air Force. There are now two services under one department. We will have, uh, you know, continuing to uh, cultivate our partnership with our allies We've had allies at our side for years. In fact, my very first assignment 32 years ago at Beale Air Force Base in California, um, I was on crew with Canadians. They were part of our crew force. They were part of our workforce. And so all I've known as an officer uh, doing space operations is doing it with allies. I've only known allies to be part of, of what we're doing. Um, we're expanding education and training to uh, include 41 different countries actually moving forward. We've also created a, a like a mid career type of uh, professional military education course for five eyes, our five eyes partners. We're including our allies in war games and exercises. Definitely the Shriver war game global Sentinel, which is more of a training type of uh, game. And space flag our competition. The C Spock is operational, as you well know. Uh, the Combined Space Operations Center at Vandenberg. We have our Five Eye partners there. We've also added Germany, and this year we've added France. We're working programs with the Japanese. Their Quasi Zenith uh, satellite system is their version of GPS. It's more of a local GPS type system. Uh, but we are going to put a US payload, a space domain awareness payload on, on their uh, position navigation and timing satellites for a, a partnership there. And of course, Norway is launching two of our uh, most high value um, satellites this year, two payloads, I should say, on their satellites um, for uh, polar communications. This has saved us $800 million uh, and it's coming to us three years sooner than we originally estimated. Our newest allies, our burgeoning allies, uh, South Korea, Brazil, and Chile. In fact, Brazil and Chile, we've had uh, space engagement talks as uh, recent as last month. And finally, innovate. We say we're born digital. We need to define what that means to be a digital service. We need data and the information in that data uh, to be more important than the platforms that the data flows over. Uh, we need to grow the skills and tools to use data differently and uh, to drive innovation and decision making. Um, in order to do that, we we understand that we need to grow our digital literacy. Uh, we've we've uh, gotten 6,000 uh, licenses to establish digital university. Those courses have begun and, and uh, there, there's been rave reviews from the uh, United States Space Force populace that have uh, started taking the courses. We're going to have 50 coders in the United States Space Force software coders by the end of this month. And uh, we're developing digital readiness pilots with uh, the three, which is the operational community. Um, we, we really need to rely on the digital infrastructure that exists and um, make sure that we're making the right investments in digital infrastructure to, to uh, make to keep things going, make sure this works for us. Uh, beyond year one, uh, I mean, certainly we're gonna be implementing uh, the, the CSOs planning guidance that he issued us. Uh, we are also gonna continue to work on flattening the bureaucracy. We're gonna work on flattening it within the Pentagon as, as, as much as we can influence and flatten here. Uh, 
we need to design the force. Uh, we need to protect what we have. Uh, we need to have that war fighting design, which is the resilience, the ability, ability to punch back, which is the offense and and help explore new missions from space as space is more accessible to America, Americans, industry, academia. Uh, there may be new missions that flow to space, things we've never even considered doing from space and the space force has to be open. Uh, to understanding what those are and 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 at the ready uh, to help uh, take those new missions on. With that, I think I will uh, pause because I've been talking for a little while here and I definitely want to get into uh, Q and A. But uh, suffice it to say that our first year has been exciting. It's been busy, but my goodness, there's so much more to do and uh, no one is taking their foot off the accelerator. I'll tell you that. Over to you. Thank you, General Emily. Just before we get started on the questions, I just want to reiterate, um, we need to have you uh, send your chat to all attendees so that we see the questions. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, let me just start with one question, General Emanuel. So you mentioned um, that the Space Force was formulated to protect the assets the, the critical space assets in all orbital regimes. How far do you expect that to extend with the recent uh, landing on the moon of China and uh, other, other countries potentially with endeavors for the moon? Do you anticipate a space force presence uh, beyond the geo belt? That is a great question and it's one that I get uh, almost every uh, time I have a speaking engagement. Today, the Space Force is bound by the, uh, the bounds of gravity, the bonds of, of, uh, of gravitational forces. We are uh, designed and uh, built to protect our assets. As those assets, um, as activity goes beyond uh, Earth's gravitational forces and pull, yes, we, we will plan to be there. Uh, today, no. In the future, yes. I had a great conversation with a company who is already uh, working on uh, science and technology uh, type of capabilities for cislunar. Uh, they have an idea to start building out the, the infrastructure for cislunar. Uh, we applaud it, we support it, and, um, and I do see our future moving beyond the Earth's gravitational pull, but uh, today that is not the case. Okay, thank you for that. All right, let me pass it over to Janet Gruden, who has a question. Hi, good, good afternoon, uh, General Armando. It's great to see you. Hi, Janet. Hey, my question is about US Space Command. Can you uh, talk about the stand-up of U.S. Space Command, how that's going, and what we should expect in the next year or two? Well, I am not uh, personally working on the stand-up of, of U.S. Space Command, um, so I, but I will answer your question in, in a couple ways. Um, uh, first, the audience may not quite understand the difference between uh, U.S. Space Force and U.S. Space Command. Uh, the force is like any other service, uh, chartered to organize, train, and equip space forces for presentation to the combatant command. The combatant command uh, for space is U.S. Space Command. That is the operational arm. Uh, they will be, you know, and uh, actually responsible for and conducting operations in space. So that's the difference there. Um, and while I'm not you know, privy to every step of the way with uh, with space command, I can tell you that we are working on this this idea, this discussion of presentation of forces. Um, if you think about how things have been uh, operating in the past, even before the space force existed, and even before space command existed, um, all of our forces were 
doing operations. Uh, when we were, uh, uh, when the operational arm was under US strategic command, for example, uh, all of our forces were, were essentially being presented for operations. Um, but as we uh, think about space differently, as we think about space as a warfighting domain, we really have to revisit how we present forces. And we're gonna be working very closely with the US Space Command to do this in the next year. Um, from a service perspective, where our responsibilities are organized, train and equip, um, we need to uh, look at this from the perspective of being responsible for readiness so and, and training and education and test and TTP development. Um, so potentially we retain service, retain forces in order to you know, do that better in order to improve readiness, in order to uh, make sure that the forces we ultimately present uh, are the most advanced with the most advanced training. They have, you know, the highest readiness. Um, we, you know, we might need to reconstitute some forces for sustainment or upgrades or that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we are working with US Space Command on that. And I know Space Command hasn't declared, you know, for example, IOC or, or FOC. I know they're continuing to grow and build their capabilities, and we're working uh, together uh, in the very near future on this force presentation concept. That's what I have. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's pass it over to Rachel Cohen. Hi, can you guys hear me all right? Great. Um, I was hoping you could just dig in a little bit more on the intelligence activity um, that you were talking about as, as you're looking to stand up a new NSIC, I guess, instead of NASIC. Um, you know, what, what's the process of, of getting those people up and running and, and how do you see them contributing in different ways? Thank you for that question. Uh, we are actually building that plan right now. And uh, you know, initially what we looked at was that NASIC had a couple of squadrons that wholly uh, focused on space. And the initial thinking was, wouldn't it be reasonable to take those two squadrons that focus wholly on space and bring them over into the United States Space Force? Well, it's, it, it's just not that simple um, because they, are so um, synergized with NASIC today. So we have to put a reasonable plan together. We have to do this deliberately. We have to uh, understand exactly um, what the consequences may be for uh, separating two squadrons out and, and potentially some other activities that uh, occur at NASIC. But the ultimate goal is to create um, space intelligence that a new war fighting demand, uh, domain demands. We really need a, an activity and, and then ultimately a center focused on intelligence for space. And uh, we are working very closely with NASIC itself, with the intelligence community and with Congress to ensure uh, Everyone understands, everyone's on the same sheet of music, and the plan itself is in work right now. Thank you. Dr. Chris Shove, uh, so I apologize, it looks like I've already asked your question, but uh, did you want to ask uh, something else? Uh, no, the general answered my question. Okay, all right, thank you. So let's move to Gary Henry. Hey, good, good morning. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Excellent. General, it's, it's great to be with you today. Um, let me ask you this. Um, what, what is the single most significant thing industry could do to advance Space Force's agenda in year two? Not, not year five or 10, but I mean, just, just what actionable things could we do in year two? And then since you know the source of the question, um, is there any 
change in your answer from maybe a more traditional industry partner to, to maybe a more non-traditional one like SpaceX? I'd really be interested in your thoughts on that. Thanks, Gary. Uh, I think you guys are rapidly becoming traditional. <laughs> I shouldn't say it like that. But you are just uh, really uh, impressing the world, uh, I would say, with uh, the number of launches, the number of successes, the, uh, you know, the, the, the refurbishment that you're doing, uh, driving down prices. Um, and I know uh, that you know uh, the Space Force and the Air Force before that has been uh, quite a strong partner with uh with spacex um, on both coasts um and you know i i don't think there is a a single answer to your question there's no single um solution there's no one technology that we need i you know i i spent um a lot of time uh, this morning talking about all kind of of, of activities um but i think the best thing we can do is um, to continue, well, first to continue to talk and engage and, and so that you understand exactly what we're thinking. Uh, I know General Raymond has said this before. I've heard him. I think you've all heard him. You know, he doesn't want industry to have to read his mind. He wants industry to understand where we're going and uh, that requires, I think, continual dialogue, um, which is why I'm, I'm happy we're having this conversation today. Um, you know, as, as you in SpaceX um, proliferate low Earth orbit, uh, there's so much opportunity there. Um, and it's, it's not, um, I know, just for the Space Force, but there is opportunity for the Space Force as well, there's there's opportunity for us to potentially host payloads on uh, your low Earth orbit assets, like weather. Wouldn't it be amazing to have weather satellites on uh, you know any number of your low Earth orbit assets uh, to you know help proliferate the weather solution for our joint force and for the nation? Uh, what what an amazing event that would be. Uh, you know, the Space uh, um, Defense Agency is working on a transport layer, working on a low Earth orbit communication layer. Um, potentially industry, I know a lot in industry are already involved, um, but, you know, those kind of, of solutions would be fantastic. Work with academia on S&T, things that we haven't even um, thought of yet. I, you know, by the time we actually get to using the technologies that we're just kind of conceiving today, um, well, you know, I hope there's a hundred more technologies we've never even conceived of. And that's where um, companies like yours, I think, are, are, you know, are amazing thinking, thinking about uh, technologies that we need in the future. I didn't even mention machine learning or AI in, in my discussion uh, because that's just out of reach. But those kinds of technologies uh, could and should very well be what industry helps us think through as, as we move into uh, a future of potentially war fighting in the space domain. Thank you. Let me pass it over to Courtney Stead, please. Uh, hello, General. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You can? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, in, in giving your responsibilities. I know you have no time, so the fact that you're able to carve out this time has been really incredible and amazing how much you and the leadership have accomplished in this past year. Um, the question I have, and this may not be directly on on your in your portfolio, but certainly affects personnel. There have been reports that the Space Force leadership has been considering consolidating East-West 
test ranges as part of some overarching model. We've heard some references to a national space board corporation and so forth. Some, and I emphasize some of the commercial space board uh, leaders uh, have expressed informally some concerns about the potential chilling effect, if you will, of such a model. And given the emphasis of the doctrine on resiliency and, and so forth, I, I just wonder if, if you might be able to say a few words that might allay some of those, those concerns. Thank you, General. Thank you. Um, I'm not aware of the the discussion that you know and and the concerns that are that are out there um i would say you know the space force is never going to um, cut off access to space or reduce or limit access to space um, the eastern range and the western ranges are both incredibly important to the united states space force um, as are other ranges that we, you know, use from time to time, but our two main launch ranges are not going anywhere. In fact, there's uh, significant uh, modernization efforts underway, um, and and there is a discussion about organizing differently uh, that has not quite been table slapped. Um, but that in no way, uh, from what I've seen, in no way consolidates, limits, or reduces the importance of either the Eastern or Western launch ranges. Thank you. Okay, let me pass it over to Jeffrey Calderman. Well, hi, General Amanio. Thank you very much uh, on your near one year anniversary birthday for the Space Force. Great to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeff. <laughs> well, uh, General Amanio, this is, of course, the Washington Space Business Roundtable. So my question was going to be a little bit about what Gary, like what Gary Henry asked, but maybe I'll shift it a bit. You know, I know you're no longer specifically in the acquisition uh, business, but there was a, a draft Space Force report on acquisition that had some very helpful ideas in it uh, released earlier this year and I know it's been under review and I don't want to put you on the spot but it, is there anything that you might just uh, suggest that might be forthcoming in some new acquisition approaches that the Space Force might be um, doing or, or the status of that report if you're actually able to speak to it and if you can't certainly understand and thanks very much all right um, well I was on the ground floor when we wrote that report um, and the idea was to look at uh, our challenges in acquisition and they they are not limited to space um, as as you all know um, but but given the threat and the need to move faster and more agilely uh, we we took a look at uh, how how we do that differently for acquisition and uh, we actually looked at the NRO model um, as a model of, of success, where the NRO is able to bring requirements, resourcing, and acquisition uh, much closer together. When you, when you talk to people who are from the NRO, uh, they, they um, certainly they have, um, they don't have to follow the DOD 5000 uh, series uh, for acquisition, but um, they do um, they do credit this this more tightly coupling of requirements, resourcing, and acquisition together. And so our report looked at how we could potentially do that, um, pushing authority and decisions to the lowest level, and um, give the space force some more authorities or different authorities than we have today, like the ability to uh, to fund and uh, and begin new start type programs during a CR, uh, the ability to combine PEs or program elements uh, to to better manage programs um, in in a in a flatter way when you when you combine uh, program elements. Uh, 
Um, we looked at uh, the requirements process itself and are uh, getting ready to ask for special rights and uh, and uh, authorities within the JSITS process where those authorities get pressed to lower levels rather than having to go all the way up to the JROC for approval. Um, certainly classification is a big challenge and while not necessarily one of the prongs in the acquisition report, um, it, it is a huge tackle uh, for all of us here, uh, not just the Space Force, but OSD and the joint staff. We're working together to reduce the level of, of classification of uh, many of our space programs for the purposes of deterrence, for the purpose of uh, operational integration, and uh, the purpose of, of you know, getting those programs uh, more uh, accessible and uh, and more used, I would say, uh, across the board. So, uh, Jeff, there were about nine uh, proposals in our in our acquisition report, and uh, we have been working with OMB to get this report across the finish line and delivered to Congress. And that's pretty much all I can say about that. Thank you. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. I, I think we have time for maybe two more quick questions. Um, so with that, uh, let me go to Mitch Rios. Well, thank you. Hi, General Manio. Thank you for the time and, uh, and really the candid uh, discussion conversation. My question is centered around ABMS and JAD C2 and what is, uh, you know, what is US Space Force going to be doing? Is this going to be separate from the Air Force? And where do you see the focus areas? You can be involved in the on ramps um, in 2021 and beyond. Who, you know, where would be the main focus within Space Force? Those kinds of questions. Is if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch, for your question. I'm so glad a little thing popped up and told me I was muted. <laughs> uh, we are already part of ABMS and JADC2. Um, the initial use of uh, the Space Force in, in uh, these activities, and we've been part of the on-ramps as well, but the, the very initial use is the data lake we've been building, uh, which used to be uh, something called our uh, Space Surveillance Network, um, and it, it used to be, um, where, you know, just very specific military type of uh, uh, systems, our, our radars and our optical telescopes were really the only sources of space track data. Now uh, we're bringing in uh, commercial and academia and uh, allied data. We're creating a data lake and it has layers of classification to it. And that data lake has been part of ABMS just kind of as a starter. So, I mean, we've been there from the beginning uh, as, as the source of, of data for, for space surveillance and, and space track and space domain awareness. We are not going anywhere. We're going to be part of uh, the space layer of ABMS and that is being defined. It, it, you know, there's certainly no uh, concrete definition that is uh, that is published quite yet, but we are working on what the space layer of ABMS looks like, and we will certainly be part of that uh, as well. Every, we're, we're part of it every step of the way. Thank you for your question. So I apologize. We are going to have to uh, probably wrap it up, but I am going to. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the final question, um, given the charter of WSBR. So, given your incredibly stellar career and your success in smashing the proverbial glass ceiling, what advice would you give to young women with, with space aspirations? Thank you for that question, uh, Sally. I uh, I love telling young women that they can do whatever they want to do. Uh, they they just need to set their goals. They need to work hard. And they need to go for it. Uh, 
I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family where my parents told me that and taught me that from my earliest memories. I, I, there was, there was no glass ceiling, if you will, um, in my childhood. So uh, I wish that um, were the case for, for all young women and all, all children, but that's what I, that's what I say. I, you know, and don't give up. And, and, and it, honestly, it doesn't end. Um, I was just uh, talking to a, a peer of mine on the joint staff and uh, Lisa Franchetti is the new J5. She has been blowing it out of the water with her first presentation to the chairman. This is just an example uh, where she, you know, she had to put in the time to learn her new job so that the first time she stood up in front of the chairman, she spoke as an expert and, and she did it. So the hard work doesn't end. You got to, you know, have your goals, be dedicated and 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 know that hard work is the key to success at any level. Thank you. Very inspirational. Thank you so very much, Daniel Romano. Uh, we really appreciate you coming out in the, in the first winter so snowstorm, braving the sea ice and the snow. Um, so thank you again, and and thank you to all the other folks that have spoken and asked questions. Um, we really it was an excellent, excellent presentation.